that's driven with me for any period of time, you know, co-workers and uh, family members will know it's been more than it should have been. I've had to make that, you know, that horrible walk of shame where you have to walk the extra mile to the gas station to get a tank and fill it up with gas. There was a point in time I actually kept a five-gallon uh, tank of diesel fuel in my truck because I just knew I was going to run out at some point. And so, uh, but the problem is, and I started counting on that empty, or that extra five gallons, and so I was all the time running out, so I quit doing that. And now I drive a gas truck, so you don't carry a gas in your, extra gas in your truck. But I've had to make that call to my dad, hey dad, where are you at? <laughs> and as soon as I say that, he knows it's either like a breakdown or, or a gas, and uh, he's had to bring the gas more than once. And then I try to split it up. You know, if I call him last time, I'm going to call somebody else the next time. I don't want to like burn all my bridges. And, uh, so the empty gas tank, that's what I want to talk about this morning. And when I think of how does that apply to the text with Elijah? How does that apply to our life? I think of a gas tank, it's just constantly going up and down, especially if you are traveling, if you're being mobile, if you're moving forward. You're constantly going from empty to full to empty to full. That gauge is just going up and down and up and down. And life is like that. I mean, we would love it if life would just be always steady, consistent, always on the mountaintop, always good times. But um, I think it was for him. Uh, Christian group back in the day that was pretty popular. Um, they wrote a song called Life is a Roller Coaster. And uh, this is something I've, I didn't understand when I, when I was a kid, but I'm starting to understand it more and more now as I get older. The older you get, roller coasters aren't so much fun. <laughs> the up and down, the up and down, the twists and the turns, the beating. I mean, I, when, we, when we have season plan, uh, pass tickets to Six Flags, and I've got to plan and strategize how I'm going to spend that day at Six Flags. Because if I take the first, if I ride Mr. Freeze a few times in a row, I'll be beat up. And then next thing you know, I'm ruined for the rest of the day. But I don't like roller coasters the older I get. I don't like the up and down, up and down. They're still fun. But life is like that. Ups and downs, ups and downs. And when I read of the story here in 1 Kings chapter 19, we see... Elijah, just ready to give up. He's praying that he'll die. He said, I've had enough. God, I want to die. And you think, man, this guy, what has happened to him that's brought him to this point where he just wants to give up on life? What's crazy is if you read one chapter before this, 1 Kings chapter 18. Some of the greatest miracles in the life of Elijah happened in chapter 18. He's on top of Mount Carmel, and he's, he sees as a result of his prayer to God and the challenge to the, to the prophets of Baal, he sees God send fire down and consume a sacrifice. He sees this with his own eyes. And then there's been a drought in the land for three and a half years, by the way, he had prophesied that there would be a drought and God would shut up the heavens and there would be no rain for three and a half years. And so he gets to see that. But then he prays after God's revealed himself on Mount Carmel. He prays and he prays and he prays and he sees a cloud begin to form. And he sees a storm come and rain and it pours after three years of three and a half years of drought. And then, something else I don't understand, but if you can believe the first two miracles, you'll believe this. Elijah ran faster than Ahab's chariots down back into the city. He ran faster, the Bible says, than Ahab's chariots. And you can imagine, Ahab probably had the fastest horses in that nation at the time. Most of us would just give anything to have experiences like that in our life. We pray, God, just show yourself. Give me something that can prove you're real. If you do that, I'll never ever doubt you. I'll never ever get discouraged. 
I'll never ever, we say these things, we think if we could just see something miraculous in our life, we would never have doubt or never have fear or never ever get to that point where we're ready to give up. But I have news for you. You would. Because Elijah did. And so easily we forget the things that God does. And that's where Elijah is in chapter 19. Elijah is in a place where he's burnt out. That's what I want to talk about this morning. Beating burnout. Overcoming burnout in your life. And in order to overcome it, we need to know what burnout is. So here are some Here are some symptoms. Here are some signs of burnout. The first thing we see that's a sign of burnout is we depreciate our worth. 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 4. Then he went on alone in the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. I'm no better. He depreciates his worth. I'm no better than my ancestors. King James says, I'm no better than my father, my father's. You see, he's thinking pretty low of himself. But that's the first sign of burnout, is you start to think less of yourself. You start to depreciate your worth. And there's a cause. That's a sign of burnout, but there's a cause that we can see in this scripture. A cause of burnout, and that is comparing. When we get into the comparing game, that's a quick, fast track to burnout. We see him comparing himself to his ancestors. We see him comparing himself to his fathers. And the Bible says, don't compare yourself with other people. The moment you start saying, well, I wish I had their talents, or I wish I had their free time, or I wish I had their house, or I wish I had their blessing, the moment you start doing that, you start thinking less of yourself. You start thinking low down, or it might go the other way. You might say, oh, I'm so I'm so glad I'm not as bad as them. I got this. I have this. I don't. I have. That's bad too, because then you fill yourself up with pride, and that's just as destructive. But the comparing game, the Bible says, don't play that game. You're a fool if you compare yourself to someone else. He may have compared himself or compared his situation to his expectations. Here, he just had a mighty miracle happen on Mount Carmel. Fire came down. In his mind, he may have thought, I don't know where he was going, but he thought, this is going to be a revival in Israel. Things are going to change. We've had three and a half years of drought. The rain's coming. Things are about to change. His expectations, I'm sure, were high after chapter 18. But in chapter 19, right in the very beginning, those expectations are dashed. <laughs> with one message from the enemy, with one message from Jezebel. His expectations are dashed, and we find him in burnout. A lot of times you'll find when you compare yourself, you start criticizing yourself. Your worst critic lives between your two ears. The things that we say to ourselves the things that we call ourselves, the things that we beat ourselves up with or for, we're our own worst critics so many times. And that was Elijah right here in chapter 19. Don't depreciate your worth. The second sign of burnout is we underrate our work. We underrate our work. 1 Kings chapter 19 Verse 10. Elijah replied, uh, replied, I zealously serve the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down their, your altars, and they've killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. 
So right off the bat, he says, I've zealously served you, God. I've done all these things for you, but, but, and you see the discouragement just in that one word. I didn't get the results that I was expecting. The people have turned from you. They're, they've torn down the altars. They're killing the prophets. They're trying to kill me. He's blaming himself for the results. And so many times, especially I see that with parents a lot of times, we beat ourselves up over the results of where our kids are. We think, you know, we're responsible for the outcome of how everyone's life in our family is going to turn out. We feel like we're the ones that are responsible for it. And in this sign of burnout, we see another cause. This cause of burnout is trying to control everything. That's the cause of burnout in this sign where we underwent our work, where we try to control everything. We try to control the outcome. We try to control how everything is going to turn out. We think like, it all depends on me. If it's going to be, it's up to me. That's trying to control. And that will lead to burnout. Parents, we are responsible to our family. Moms and dads are responsible to their kids, to train them up, to teach them, to show by example, to give love, to, to do all these things. We are responsible to our family, but we are not responsible for our family. There's a big difference. I mean, I, somebody told me this a long time ago, and I've, I've shared it before here in this church, but God, who was the perfect father, had Adam and Eve in a perfect environment, the Garden of Eden, and in that perfect environment with perfect instructions from a loving God, they still chose to do the wrong thing. When you say you're responsible for the outcome of your kids' lives, you're saying that you're better than God. We don't, maybe we wouldn't say it in those words, but that's what we're acting like. Like somehow we're responsible for the way everyone turns out. Don't try to control everything. Some things are out of our control. The third sign of burnout is we exaggerate our woes. We exaggerate our woes, our problems, our difficulty. We exaggerate them. We make them up bigger than what they really are. Verse 10 again. It says, but the people of Israel have broken their covenants with you. They've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me too. He said, I'm the only one left. I'm alone. Later on, when we read in the chapter, God tells me, you're not alone. There's 7,000 prophets in Israel that have not bowed to Baal. They're faithfully serving me. You think you're the only one? There's 7,000 more just like you that are still serving me in spite of all the pressures around me. And then he said, everyone's trying to kill me. Everyone. They're all trying to kill me. Well, when you read the text, it wasn't everyone. It was Jezebel. One woman. She was the queen of Israel, but one woman was trying to kill Elijah. And he said, everyone. He's exaggerating his problems. It wasn't as bad. It was bad, but it wasn't as bad as he was making it out to be. Now, guys, I understand when you have one woman against you, sometimes it can seem like it's the whole world against you, all right? <laughs> I better say, women is probably the same way too. When you have that one person that's against you, it can feel like the whole world is against you. But that's not the truth. The cause of this symptom of burnout, 
The underlying cause was that Elijah was confusing feelings for facts. He was confusing his feelings for facts. Feelings lie to us. Plain and simple. Emotions, a lot of times, will lie to us and tell us things that aren't true. You may have walked into church this morning and had this feeling, God's not close to me. I don't feel close to God. God's nowhere close to me. God doesn't care about me. You might have had those feelings driving here to church this morning. Why am I even doing this? God doesn't even care. Those could have been your feelings, but they're not the facts. God loves the whole world. If you're a Christian, God lives inside of you, in your heart. Yes. You're just as close to Him feeling like that as you are when you're feeling Him on the mountaintop. Those are the facts. Yes. Psychologists will say we need to trust or we need to get in touch with our feelings. We need to be in touch with our feelings. And that's true. We, we do need to be in touch with our feelings. Anytime you're ignoring a feeling or you're um, um, hiding a feeling, that's an area in your life that you won't be able to grow in. It's an area that you're living in denial. And until you actually acknowledge that you have this area, you won't ever grow in that area. So feelings aren't complete. You know, they're not all bad. But that's not the most important thing. In, in the society that we live in today, we put a high premium on feelings. They put a high emphasis on feelings. We're seeing it right now with the whole transgender bathroom issue. And I watched a video just of, of even I was watching last night, where all the emphasis was on feelings. Well, if you feel like you're a woman, it doesn't matter what your anatomy is, it doesn't matter how you were born, if you feel a certain way, that's what you are. Ignore the facts. If you feel like you're a Chinese person, it doesn't matter if you're a Caucasian, just because, and that's what we're leading with this reasoning, it's called <coughs> emotional reasoning, where we let our feelings lead the way. We let our feelings trump Facts. Feelings are important. But there's something much more important than feelings. That's facts. That's the truth. More than getting in touch with feelings, we need to get in touch with truth. John chapter 8 verse 32 says, You'll know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Knowing the truth about yourself will set you free. And when Elijah started to know the truth about himself, that's when he found freedom from his circumstance. And the fi final sign of burning is we abdicate our will. We abdicate our will. We abdicate our dreams. We give up on our dreams. We give up on our hope. We lose our will to go on, to carry on. We abdicate our will. And let's go back to verse 4 here in our text. He said, And he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. He said, Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. You have already died. He's given up. I've had enough. Um, we see this in relationships. Probably more than anything today. Where people just get to the end of the rope. You hear a husband say, I don't love my wife anymore. I've fallen out of love. Or you'll hear a wife say, I don't love my husband anymore. And uh, so because of that, they'll think it's, time to end the relationship. It's time to end the marriage. It's time to just cut ties and go separate ways. I don't love 
him. I don't love her anymore. And I want to say, so what? You know, and I've been married 17 years. I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't say uh, an expert on the area of marriage. There's a lot of areas I need to grow in, in this department. But I know this, I've fallen, I'm talking about the feeling of love, okay? I've fallen in and out of love multiple times. Sometimes overnight, one night, I might feel like I don't love my wife. The very next day, she's the best thing in the world. Okay? It's the craziest thing, but I know that's how flighty feelings are. Yeah. Yeah. The Beatles wrote a song that said, all you need is love. All you need is love. And I'm telling you, that's not all you need in a marriage. You don't need a feeling. You need, I mean, love's important. Having the feeling's great. Don't get me wrong, okay? That's great, but you need more than that. You need commitment. Yes. You need maturity. I need that. <laughs> you need integrity. You need character. You need patience. You need unselfishness. Those are things you need in a marriage. You need them in a relationship. Not just love. Love's important. But you need all these other things. The underlying cause of this sign of burnout is we compromise our commitment. We compromise. We start talking ourselves out of the commitments we've made. And that so often leads to burnout. And we see Elijah was there. I don't want to go on. I, don't want to, I just don't want to do it anymore. I'm done. And the sad thing is some of you might be at that point this morning. I mean, I've been there. I've been there multiple times in my lifetime. But you might be at the place where you're like, I'm just ready to check out. I'm done with this relationship. I don't think I can make it anymore. Or you might be at a place where you're just ready to check out on God. God, I sought you, I don't feel you. I thought you were going to do this for me. You did do that. And now I'm at a place where I'm just ready to give up. I've had enough. You might be at that place with your job, your career. I'm just ready to give up. I'm, I'm done with it. I'm sick of it. I'm tired. I'm, I'm just worn out. I'm ready to give up. You might be that way with life. Where you feel like you have no purpose in life. No reason to keep going. That's where Elijah was. A great man. A great man of God. But he got to a place of burnout where he was real willing to give up everything and give up on everything. What do you do if you're at that place this morning of burnout? Because I don't know where you're at, but I would just venture to say in a group this big, there's somebody here that's at that place in one area of your life where you're just at your wit's end, at the end of your rope, and you're ready to just let go. What do you do? Well, let's look at Elijah. <coughs> Number one, rest your body. Rest your body. Practical. 19, verse 5 through 8. Then he lay down, and he slept under a broom tree. But as he was sleeping, the angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread, baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank, and he lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank, and the food gave him enough energy to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai. I'd like to know what he ate. 40 days and 40 nights on a couple meals. Um, I guarantee it, it wasn't this tofu or birdseed stuff that people were eating these days. It was something substantial. You know, the King James says the angel made him a cake. <laughs> Man, we thought that depression and eating is something like new, that like when you get depressed, you start eating. It's been going on since the days of Elijah. He's depressed. And God, instead of showing up and saying, Elijah, 
what are you doing here? You should, I mean, just after all these things I've done, you can start scolding him or, or tearing him down from de- feeling the way he was feeling. God didn't do that. He let the man sleep. And then he fed him. He let him sleep some more and he fed him. Just real practical things. He didn't say go shopping. <laughs> so many times we think, oh, beat the pressure, I'll go shopping. That will make me more depressed. Especially when the credit card bills come in. Or you go to pay the actual bills that you have and you don't have the money in the bank account to pay it. Tim talked about that last week. Don't go shopping if you're depressed. You'll make bad decisions. Um, but God fed him. Told him to get some rest. The Bible says in Proverbs 127.2, it's vain to get up early and to stay up late. God gives his children rest. God understands our body more than we do sometimes. And uh, God knew Elijah had been through a lot. He had expended a lot of energy. I'm sure outrunning those chariots wore him out physically. And after all of that, that was part of why Elijah was at the place where he was. God said, you need some rest. Um, Vince Lombardi, the famous coach for the Green Bay Packers, he said, fatigue will make cowards of us all. When you get tired, things seem a lot bigger than they really are. I I see this with my kids. I see it especially the younger they are, the more you see it. Like Ross, he's six years old. Just the other night, reading a bedtime story. Okay, so it's time for bed. We know he's been up all day. He's tired. And it wasn't the story he wanted me to read. It's the one we've been reading like every night up to this point, but different chapters. And uh, he wanted wanted us to read a different book. Well, we're in the middle of this book, so we're not going to switch. You would have thought it was the end of the world. I mean... And he was just beside himself. And in my mind, I know, Ross, if you just calm down, listen to the story, go to sleep tomorrow, you're going to feel great. But at that moment, he's just at the end of it. I mean, he's ready to give up. And that's where, that's where Elijah was. And all of us are pretty much kids at heart. When we get tired and worn out, that's what happens. Never make a major decision when you're tired. Never make a major decision when you're tired or when you're depressed. That's when you'll make a horrible decision. I, I, I have a feeling most of the suicides that happen, if those people had had a chance or had waited maybe a few more days, slept on it, they would have woke up the next morning with a different feeling about it. But I, I don't know every situation. But I would have to say, if people would get a little bit more rest, take care of their bodies, they probably would make smarter decisions in that area. It's amazing what a good night's sleep will do for perspective. (laughs) Wake up the next morning and what seemed like it was impossible the night before, all of a sudden nothing changed. It was just our outlook. So the first thing you do is rest your body. The second thing you do is release frustration. 1 Kings 9, uh, 19, 9 through 10. But the Lord said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I zealously serve the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of their prophets, and I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Elijah vents. I mean, he lets out these emotions. God says, what are you doing here? And Elijah gives him an ear for it. He says this. I'm afraid. I'm bitter. You know, I preached. I served you. And these people aren't doing what I told them to do. I'm afraid they're going to kill me. I'm angry. I'm angry. At the whole situation, I might even be angry at you, God. I'm angry at Ahab. I'm angry at... I'm just angry. I'm lonely. I'm here by myself in this cave. I'm worried. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm just ready to give up. And on top of all of it, I'm depressed. We see those six emotions. Those six things being poured out 
right there in one verse. No wonder Elijah was burnt out. No wonder he was worn out. Rick Warren says, Revealing the feeling is the beginning of healing. Revealing the feeling is the beginning of healing. We weren't designed to hold it all in. We've got to let it out sometimes. And listen, I'm glad we don't have a choir here because I'd be preaching to the choir. <laughs> but I struggle with this more than anybody else. Holding feelings in, not expressing myself, not sharing my emotions like I need to, and bottling them up. But man, it will churn in your stomach and it will cause all kinds of mental problems and health problems if we hang on to it. Why do you think in Psalms, there's so many Psalms that David wrote where, you're like, why did God even allow that to be in the Bible? Um, I mean, David, where he's so angry at his enemies, he's like, God, I pray that they just be buried alive. Here's, I mean, the man of God, bury them alive. And there's one verse where he, he's rejoicing and he's almost like hoping one day that his enemies' babies will have their heads dashed against a rock. I mean, that's pretty intense. David, and, and I wrote down the verse because I thought you probably, probably won't believe me. Psalm 137, verse 9. Psalm 137, verse 9. He's, he's saying, God, I, I would be happy if their babies were crushed against a rock. Why would God allow something like that to be put in the Bible? He wants us to know it's okay for us to vent. Especially when we're venting to him. To pour out our heart. Part. Most of the Psalms were, I'm sure, written in a secret place before God. Where, where David is just so open with his heart and his feelings towards God. And then a lot of times, by the time you get to the end of the chapter, you find God's lifting him up. Bring him out, bring him out, bringing him out of that pit. And you find him in victory again. But if you just cut it off there at the, at the beginning, you'd be like, why is this even in here? God wants us to share our feelings. Release our frustrations. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your cares on Him, for He cares for you. Cast all your cares. We, you know what we do today? It's we either hide them, we either hold them inside, or we cast them all on Facebook. Every little problem we have, we just put on Facebook. Put on Facebook. Well, most of the time, your friends on Facebook probably don't really care about your problems. And sometimes they just gossip about them later. Um, but that's not to say we don't need to share our feelings and our frustrations with people. We do. And that's one of the exciting things about life groups in our church. And that's why we keep on pushing it so much. A lot of you have joined in with it. But more can. It's a place where we can connect with people, where we can build relationships, and where we can share frustrations. Right now, it's early. Early. I mean, Tim said, you know, it's been several months. We have been doing this for several months, but we're still growing in this area where we can feel comfortable sharing our heart and our feelings with other people. That's important. Keep on doing it. And, uh, and God will bless you for it. And you'll overcome burnout by doing it. It's important to have people that you can share life with. The third way that you can beat burnout. Not only get rest, not only release frustration, but three, refocus on God. Refocus on God. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. God tells him, go out, stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told him, as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were, were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. And Elijah heard it. He wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went and stood at the entrance of the cave. Refocus on God. God said, come out of the cave. You're in this dark cave 
All you're thinking about is you, your circumstances, your problems. Come out here, I want to show you something. Why do you think God showed them all that? The earthquake, the wind, the fire. I think he showed Elijah that because he wanted to show him, hey, I'm powerful. I'm powerful. I have power over the elements of this earth. I'm a sovereign God. I have all power. I'm in control here. I'm in control. Jezebel, she's not in control. Remember the rain for three and a half years? There was no rain? Who opened up the rain? I did. God's reminding Elijah, who is in control? Why? Because at the root of all burnout is this. We're trying to play God. That's the root of burnout. We're trying to play God. Trying to control the outcome. Trying to control everything. And God says, no. Just come out of the cave and watch me be God for a little bit. Maybe you'll refocus and get the right mindset. Frank Sinatra was a great singer, had lots of good songs, and one was real popular called I Did It My Way. I Did It My Way. And it goes through all these things that he did, and he did it his way. His last words, you know what the last words of Frank Sinatra were? The last words on his deathbed, Frank Sinatra said this, I'm losing it. <laughs> I'm losing it. The thing is, he never had it. None of us have it. None of us have control over the very breath that we have in our lungs. None of us have control over our hair. None of us have control over these things. God yes. has control. Refocus on God. Recenter your life on God. And the fourth and final way to beat burnout is resume serving others. 1 Kings 19, verse 15. Then the Lord said to him, Go back the same way you came. Travel to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive there, anoint King Haziel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, to be the king of Israel, and anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Machpelah, to replace you as my prophet. God gives him a job to do. He says, go back to what you were doing. Where you left, you were doing a good job. Go back to it. You got a little break. You've had a chance to vent. You've had a chance to rent, uh, rest. You've had a chance to refocus on me. Go back and resume serving others. Stop thinking about yourself so much. Stop thinking about yourself all the time and start thinking about others. I know when you're in pain or when you're in a place of discouragement or a place of depression, that sounds easier said than done. Stop thinking about yourself so much and think about others. But the, the truth is, if you can just muster enough strength to open up your eyes or to lift your eyes up off of yourself and start focusing on others, You'll find out there's other people that are hurting a lot of times worse than you are. A lot of people that are in a bigger struggle than you are. And you'll find that you can be a place of help for them, a place of encouragement. And there's nothing that will beat burnout or discouragement or depression like helping someone else and seeing the joy that comes from that. There's four dimensions in our life 
that we face burnout in. Four areas of our life that we face burnout. And you might be in a place where you're burnt out in every one of these, or you might be in a place where you're only burnt out in one of them. But these are the four areas, the four dimensions of burnout. Our physical body, our emotional state, our emotions, our spiritual well-being, and our relational aspect of our life. Four areas, our physical, our emotional, our spiritual, and our relational life. And we can face burnout in every one of these. Quick ways, just practical ways, to overcome burnout. If you're burnt out physically, it might just be a, a matter of slowing down, getting some rest, rearranging your calendar, taking a break, finding ways to feed yourself to rebuild your physical body. If you're emotionally burnt out this morning, maybe you just need to find a friend that you can talk to. Or find a pastor or a counselor. Someone that you can share your heart with and release some of these emotions. Or an altar. Definitely find an altar or a place where you can give your feelings to the Lord. Or spiritual burnout. If you're burnt out spiritually, it might be just a time to refocus on God. Recenter your life around you. Find out, I've been giving my life to way too many things. I've been spending too much time at work. I've been spending too much time watching sports. I've been spending too much time with entertainment. And I've not been spending enough time with God. I'm burnt out spiritually. Refocus on God. Center your life on Him. And the final thing is relational. Get involved helping someone else. Get involved. And uh, you'll find really quick, you know, so many times you might sit there and think, I have no friends. I just wish somebody would be my friend. I wish somebody would just reach out to me and show me love or talk to me. And if you stay there, you'll get depressed, you'll get beat down, you'll give up. Turn it around. Turn it around and start thinking, who in this room needs a friend? Who in this room needs somebody to love them? Who in this room needs a word of encouragement? Take the focus off of you. Think about others. And the moment you do that, and you start doing that, you'll find out that you're recovering from burnout. Elijah went on and he did great things. He passed on influence and ministry in that nation. And his, his legacy lived on long after he died. And that's what we all want. We want to leave this world better than when we came. Amen. Amen. I want to sing that song just in closing. And I want to open up the altars. Just... Uh, if you want to make a commitment to God in an area of your life where you need just God to work and move. If you're in a place of discouragement, um, just take some action steps this morning to, uh, to get help. And uh, I'm going to sing this song, uh, Psalm 54. Speak to the dreams that seem to die, prophesy, break, uh, speak to the is it dreams? Yeah. Prophesy and bring them back to life. But God can bring back to life the dead bones, the dry bones that are in your life, the areas of death, your dreams that have been dashed. God can bring them back to life this morning. Let's put our hope and trust in. Let's stand and sing this song together. And uh, we're going to turn over to the pastor. Yeah.
So let's not get over in this morning. I'm not. Hallelujah. Is anyone in a hurry? I'm not. We got a dinner afterwards. After at 2 o'clock, we're going to have a big wedding deal. And we want to invite you all to come back for that. So you might not even want to go and stay here. And uh, uh, let's just have a time around these scriptures. If God restore and rebuild and renew us for his glory. Amen. Let's come. Lord, bless and move in every heart and life. Let your will be done in our lives for your glory. Around these altars, in our homes, Lord, for your purpose and glory. And we'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name.